Yeah, so the three verticals has been really the uh, sector we have strong passion and also strong conviction we have in the past couple of years. I would say in the past uh, one year or so within enterprise AI, we did a lot of company focus on AI infrastructure. You know, it's not only about the application layer, it's about how to solve the major challenge of AI. GPU consumption way too high, energy consumption way too high, AI on the edge devices, right? How to not to building only the large model, but the small vertical model. And the last thing is really the data privacy. We have companies doing AI governance, fiber computing, especially for industry or highly regulated, for example, financial, healthcare, insurance industry, having the data layer, the compliance problem resolved as the number one priority before industry think about integrated AI. So we have great solution on that end. And within AI in healthcare, that's also my passion because before I started Fusion Fund, I was an entrepreneur and uh, I do and sold a healthcare company myself. So I think healthcare industry have huge amount of data. 30% of the human society data are actually healthcare related. We only utilize less than 5% so far. And it's a uh, opportunity for building up different applications of this, you know, 20% US GDP large market opportunity. So we are also looking this year, we probably did four companies are doing vertical AI within healthcare. And uh, the last vertical within industry automation, you know, of course, physical AI is one of our focus area. I was actually in this uh, robotics uh, hub center in San Francisco last night. They have also showcased the industry level uh, robotics application. Uh, I'm not a big fan of humanoid robots, so we don't invest in humanoid robots. <laughs> we invest more on the supply chain manufacturing related robotics application. We like company can do hardware software integration, not just a component company. We also like uh, application within healthcare sector like surgical robots. And the last uh, subsector is really just a physical AI application within space industry. We have company doing autonomous robotic system within space infrastructure launched a gas station essential on the moon and which is ongoing right now. Um, consider how fast the space industry are evolving the possibility of the space factory. I feel like in on the Earth, sometimes we talk about using humanoid robots to replace human, but human, ro human robots are expensive. If you have to spend 200, 300K to build a robot, not as good, as efficient, as a dynamic as a human being, we may have that labor cost issue in California, outside of California in Texas, right? I don't think the, 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 the number really <laughs> makes sense. But in the space environment, Sending someone up is very expensive. Think about uh, the whole system we have to build out. Then, then on top of that, if you can just send a robot up, not necessarily human shape, any autonomous robotic system, that could really power the future for space factory, space infrastructure, and it's happening in the next two to three years. We also invest in early in the SpaceX. So now you also see the successful launch of the Starship. I think within a couple of years, the launching cost could be as low as $10 million. What does it mean? Each launch, $10 million. Starship is the largest rocket in the whole world. It can carry over 100 people per launch and over 650 satellite per launch. So per person, do a quick math. $10 million for 100 people per person is 100K. Not that expensive, right? $10 million for 650 satellite. 20K per satellite. Not that expensive as well. So we're going to have amazing access to the satellite data, space infrastructure the physical AI can be integrated from day one. So yeah, sorry, it's a long answer. Just want to share about our specific sector, sub-sector focus. I think the physical AI together with AI is a hot fast for. But that doesn't mean everything the application gonna be much available. Um, one, you may, maybe were less interested in some of the far uh, longer tail kind of investments that like you were looking for maybe a shorter payback model. No, or, not really. Or I looking for more traction or product market fit before you invest. Give me a little bit more understanding in terms of your criteria. I think any good early stage investor won't just look for short term return, right? Uh, the, the beauty of early stage is uh, we go through cycles. We're looking for not only just multi billion. Now, billion dollars is not sexy. Now we talk about trillion dollars. But uh, AI does give us a huge opportunity in the future. So we're looking for long term return. But on the other side, I feel that this market. Uh, it's very crowded. If you think about signal noise ratio, it's actually really low. So in order for us to be smart investor and also back in the right funder from the day one, I think really see the market validation, uh, or maybe some signal for market validation is important. 
And uh, fundamentally, no matter how awesome the AI model benchmark data, how amazing the AI model is, when you're really integrated into the industry application, customers only care whether it's better, faster, cheaper. They don't really care whether you have the latest model, how you can solve the Olympic metal problem. It's more about industry integration, enterprise use cases. We don't touch anything consumer AI, so probably it's a different mindset there for the B2B industry application. We need to be very practical. So building something people need instead of just people like a family for you, they won't pay for you. So what we do is when we invest in early stage, uh, most of the company we invest in, they're not uh, having any revenue, yet. they're like free revenue. But what we can do is after we're putting the capital for investment, we can also quickly help them grow the revenue from zero to 10 to 20 million dollars. And then the beauty for the founder is, nowadays you can become so AI native and AI empowered. We have a company, give you an example, we have a company, Otter AI. Many yeah, of you probably know about them. Now yeah. they're over 120 I million dollar revenue. They started, that's when we, we invested in 2019. So they're a hyper growth company. They haven't raised money since 2021. Amazing company. They take, you know, from 2021 to now, grow from uh, 10 million to 120 million dollars. We have another company called Yura.com. They started about three years ago. Revenue now also grow in the same, same speed in the past one year, from free revenue now to a couple hundred million dollar revenue, become a unicorn. That's how fast this can evolve. Look at their team size, very small team. So that's the beauty for the company. Some of them only less than 20, 30 people. We also have another company grow revenue from zero to 20 million dollars in one year. Team size less than 11 people. That's good news for the founder. You don't need to raise a lot of capital, resources, and manpower to build a company with valuation over 100 million or dollars. Then the efficiency will be optimized, and also founder will be also optimize their ownership and valuation. It's kind of interesting, right? Because you see some companies still raising these huge rounds, but you're yeah. pointing to a scenario where not really necessary anymore. Single digit million dollars is enough to get you through seed, maybe Series A. Yeah, that's the reason we have some information gap here. If you look at the uh, last quarter, $90 million deployed into the venture industry, but more than 50% went to the company like OpenAI and Sorpay. Right. And uh, do you define them as a venture company? They're not venture company right. anymore, right? They're like a multi trillion they're half a trillion dollar valuation. So if you really look at the news, it's kind of occupied by this uh, huge amount of fundraising for the fundamental model company. Because OpenAI has to compete with Gemini, with Google. And Google are not startup at all, right? So we should now use it as a reference in terms of the how to really go with the current funding market. Another thing is there's a layer of uh, Model layer, info layer, and application layer. We don't touch much on the model layer. We only invest in companies doing vertical small model and build on top of open source model because that's more cost efficient. Eventually, it can reduce the cost of the GPU, cost of the energy consumption, and also small model have another benefit. Remember I mentioned early on about the data privacy compliance for the highly regulated industry. If you want to persuade a hospital or insurance company upload everything to the cloud in order to use AI, I think it's a mission impossible. But if you have a small model, the model can be deployed on local devices and local private network, this industry might be open to work with you. That's the reason it's hard for them to directly work with a large company like ChatGPT. A smaller startup would have a, a big opportunity to work with them. There are strategic partners for most of the company in the ecosystem. We also work closely with NVIDIA. I was in DC on Wednesday speak at the NVIDIA GDC conference there. Uh, we work closely with Microsoft. They have an amazing AI startup program. Founders should consider, you know, they are very generous. And also uh, Amazon doing great, also offer lots of free credit, Google, of course. So I think all these large model company, they also are trying to build up their ecosystem. And the startup can sit on top of it, and that's how they win the future of AI, instead of trying to do everything themselves. I think for OpenAI, the challenging part is uh, they're in between. They want to build up ecosystem and work with startup. They also try to do things for themselves. And so this is a, a little bit tricky position they're at uh, right now. But on the other side, uh, the thing is we do early stage. So I don't think any of the model company mentioned are early stage company by definition. Uh, so we're really focused on the early stage founder that leverage the existing ecosystem and grow from there. Of course, we've been investing in enterprise AI, healthcare and the transformation since 10 years ago. And uh, AI is not a new thing for us. Uh, back in the day, we just called it machine learning. Right, data science now becomes this hot buzzword. 
but I still go back to what I mentioned earlier. We need to be practical. If you are focused on solution, focus on enterprise industry, again, they won't pay premium price just because you said my AI can solve a mathematic problem, blah, blah, blah. They just only care what is better, faster, cheaper, easy to integrate, and solve a true problem they have. Lots of use cases within industry people may not even aware of. Like today I talked with a bank, a CEO of a major bank. We have a company using vertical AI to automate the whole process of commercial paper issuing, CP. Many people even didn't know what is CP. CP is huge volume. Walmart is doing 60 billion commercial paper issuing every single year. And this is a huge market most of people didn't know. And they are willing to pay for lots of AI solution, pay for lots of money for this type of AI solution. Interesting. So we are here talking a lot about physical AI. Yeah. Is it a correct assumption to think that that might those companies might require more investment because hardware because it might be more people intensive? I think it depends on how you define physical AI. Yeah. We have lots of different definitions. My definition for physical AI is really just the leverage AI to interact with the physical yeah. world. So it doesn't mean you have to 100% integrate with the hardware to interact with physical world. And also in order to power physical AI, two things we're looking at right now. One is simulation system. Right? We still need to have a better simulation system to help us train the robotics, understand the, the real world. The second thing is the data layer. We talk about we have so much data. We don't have enough data for robotics for training. It's just uh, it's very different from the large language model training on the text. So, Shout out to Snowflake, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this two, yeah, I think Snowflake is a great company. So I think these two are the two layer we're looking at. On top of that, of course, there are also different type of robotics application. But I think it depends on how you look at the hardware layer. I'm a mature sense background. I did lots of research on different type of sensor. Sensor is essential is the entrance of the data. And you want to have certain control of the entrance of the data, understanding of the entrance of the data, and the view things on top of it. But if you just only want to view the hardware component, margin is really low. It's not the best business. I did research on this one on battery, bio sensor, you know, it's an important technology, but you have a very low bar margin, it's hard to control the price. So it has to do the hardware software integration. Another thing is finding the right direction in terms of industry application to penetrate to do the initial penetration. Um, another thing in terms of physical AI, I think we have to talk about robotics regarding US and China. And uh, I think robotics here, lots of performance are really fascinating, but the cost is really high. If you look at some robotics company from China, their cost is like 10%, 20% the, of the robotics company here. Even I talked with the Stanford Robotics Center, lots of research professors there try to work with, try to import robotics from China to lower their research costs. So, so we also have to be very practical on the hardware layer, how to make it more cost efficient. And also, uh, hopefully, you know, the US-China thing can be studied better in the future to help us also benefit from the supply chain capability from the, the other side of the world.